My name is Noah Eccles. I have a degree in English from Kennesaw State University. This is my colleague Clay Duda. He's a journalist, has a deg degree in journalism. So what the hell are we doing at a tech conference, right? <laughs> well, we both work in digital media for the Center for Sustainable Journalism. The center is based out of Kennesaw State University, and it exists to try to find new models for high quality, ethically sound, financially sustainable journalism in the digital age. So we launched launch different journalism projects and experiments to try to find new business models for journalism. Um, Clay and I are tasked with leading digital media, so we do everything from web design to social media, um, digital marketing, things like that. Um, and we like to think that we approach digital media from a different perspective than what is normal. We look at it from more of a social science perspective. What are the users doing out there and how can we kind of get involved in different communities on the web, very ethnographic studies, if you will. So. So what we're going to talk about today, a little bit of uh, user experience, social science, that kind of deep thinking nonsense. But before we get started, we're going to run a, a little bit of an experiment here. So we need a volunteer, a very brave individual. We're not going to embarrass you. We're going to ask you some questions, but I promise you'll know the answer to every question we ask you. And you'll get any one of these prizes up here. We've got books. We've got an Angry Birds plush toy that makes some kind of noise somehow. Um, we've got Facebook stamps, t-shirts. So we need a volunteer. Who's brave? I think she was first back here. Sorry. You're you closer, gotta, you gotta but, but she beat you. Do it. <laughs> yeah. So what's your name on the way up? Chandra. Chandra, great name. So you're going to take a seat here. Clay, you want to make this thing run? Yep. <laughs> Grab that microphone. And we're just going to do a little interview. Clay's going to ask you some questions. All right. Well, Noah already asked your name, so... Chandra, where are you from? Uh-oh, uh-oh, hang on, hang on. Let's fix this. <laughs> That's all right. That's part of the experiment. <laughs> okay, take two. <laughs> Chandra, where are you from? Um, I live in Savannah right now. Um, where'd you go to school? Where'd you go to high school at? Preble Shawnee in Ohio. Where'd you go to college at? Ashland University in Ohio and then Marshall University in West Virginia. <laughs> um, do you have any pets? Yes. How many? One dog. One dog. What's Boston his name? Terrier. Massey. Do you have a significant other? Yes. What's his or her name? Gary. Married Gary. seven years. Nice. Well, how many friends do you have? Facebook friends. How <laughs> answer it how you want. However, However you, you quantify answer. friends. Um, gosh. I mean, I would say 20 close friends. 20 close friends. Um, where do you bank? Bank of America. How much money do you make each year? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just quit my job um, teaching, and I'm a full-time freelance writer, so zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, this next question is, how, how many credit cards do you have? Three. What's your largest credit limit? 15,000. What bank is that with? City. Uh, what's your mother's maiden name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's basically what we're going for. Why did you choose to stop answering those questions? I don't know. Well, that one is, you know, standard for privacy, I guess. You answered a lot. You went farther than I. Really? Yeah, yeah. really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep going if you want me to. What's your social security no. number? No. <laughs> so what made you stop at that point? Well, that's just a trigger question, I guess. makes me think of credit Too personal. cards and money. And All right, so if you were in a different setting, let's say you were sitting in your living room with your, with Gary, was that his name? Mm -hmm. With Gary, would you have answered the question? You mean if he asked me? Mm -hmm. Yes. What if you were on Facebook? Would you put it on Facebook? No. So what's the difference? I guess, I, well, I actually, uh, last year, somebody um, used my, stole my identity. Eight, eight grand in Mexico they spent. So mm -hmm. I had to That's fight that. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, they were in the president's suite, so. So you seem like a very outgoing person. Did the camera do anything? Is that weird? Uh, I'm a little bit shaking, but I think that's more people, not. That's the people, not yeah. the camera. Okay. Very good. Everybody give her a round of applause. She's a good participant. Have your pick of, of anything we have here. We have lots of prizes, and there's. Okay. It's very good. Okay. Very good book. So we have more questions at the end. You'll have a chance to win more of this stuff. All right, so another quote by Mr. Goffman. Information about the individual helps to define the situation, enabling others to know in advance what he, 
sorry for the feminists out there, this was 1959, and advance what he will expect of them and what they may expect of him. Informed in these ways, the others will know how best to act in order to call forth desired response from him. Anybody want to translate that for us? I'll give you a toy. <laughs> Anybody? You got it? If you know somebody, you know what to ask and how to ask it in order to get them to do what you want. That's right. All right, so she said, if you know someone, you know what to ask to get them to do what you want. On the other hand, you know how to act to that person to get them to think of you in the way that you want them to think of you. So in the, in the real world, I, you know, I wore a college shirt today because I knew I was going to be standing in front of many of you. Um, when I go to work, you know, I dress up for that. I usually wear dress pants. I tuck my shirt in. When I'm at home, I'm probably wearing pajama pants or shorts, right? Because it's a different audience. I have different expectations. I'm putting forth a different image depending on the situation I'm in. So she was willing to go to a certain, you know, she drew a line at a certain point based on the audience that she was speaking to. If she was at home, she has a different audience, she would go further with those questions. So I think that's what Goffman's getting at. We all perform for each other based on who's right in front of us, right? Now, when you take that online, what happens? It becomes a lot more difficult, right? Because you don't know who's listening to you. You can try to imagine audiences, but we don't know exactly who's listening to us. That's where we're going. So, so this is what we'll talk about today. Um, in the real world, the context dictates a lot of what you're willing to share like the young lady just showed us um, we're going to talk about context collapse and how you lose a lot of that context when you're online uh, we're going to look at two leading philosophers i guess or leading businessmen in the field uh, pretty much everybody knows who mark zuckerberg they want to be philosophers want to be philosophers <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. Christopher Poole is the founder of 4chan. If you're not familiar with that, it's an imaging, uh, mess, image, image board, image messaging Basically. board. Yeah. Um, we're going to look at the, the theories behind their platforms and why they do the things they do, some of the changes they've made on, over the years, um, weighing in accountability and kind of playing into that context. And then we're going to let you decide and get everybody's opinion because, well, we all shape the web and the world. And, see where we should go from here. So if you look at the description that's in your little thing, this is probably the least applicable or practical session at Geek In this weekend. But I like to think that it's maybe the most. Because if you're a developer out there, these are things that you really got to be thinking of. If you're a user, these are things that you want to be thinking of too. So we're going to start by watching a video. This guy here has a PhD, so he's a lot smarter than I am. So he's going to explain a little, t a little bit to you about what Context Collapse is about. It's about four minutes, so bear with me. He's very boring. He's an academic. He's a professor at Kansas, is that right? Yeah, Kansas. Kansas. So, uh, yeah, bear with him. He's a little boring, but the video gets interesting. You're trying to form this new mask, your new identity, in a space where it seems like everybody is watching and yet nobody's there. And so it's like, it feels like at once the most private space because it's your own bedroom or wherever it might be, but it's also quite possibly the most public space on the planet. You know, when you think about the number of people that might actually see this. And so there begins to be a lot of reflection about self on YouTube, and you can just it's, it's a great place to study self and identity if you're into that. Um, well, I'll give you just a little bit of background on this. If you think of like Charles Cooley's idea of the looking glass self, it's this idea that we actually know ourselves through, the, through our understanding of how others understand us. And this is, uh, becomes really complicated and <coughs> on when you're looking through a webcam and mediating your life through this webcam. I'll show you just one example and then I'll add on to that. And you know, you know other people are going to be observing you, but they're not right at the second that you're making your video. So you're more yourself. So this, this self-reflection happens on while, while they're looking through these webcams. But adding to it not, isn't just the fact that anybody and everybody might be looking at you through that webcam. It's also the fact that you yourself might look through that, that and see that video again someday. So there's really this hyper self-awareness that's developing as people are doing this. We live in the world of the instant replay. Around the planet, all the events are not only being recorded, but replayed. And the amazing thing about the replay is that it offers the means of recog, recognition. The first time is cognition, the second time is recognition. And the recognition is even deeper. I decided to make a blog, not only for myself, but for anyone who cares to watch, to document my transition. and. Um, I'll be able to look back, and I suppose you will too, to see, you know, how far, if at all, I've come. And so replay offers a deeper level of awareness than the, the first play. Well, we had, you know, been getting into some very 
large matters about the effects of this new environment, this new electric environment on man and his awareness of himself. I guess that's what makes me so uncomfortable talking on camera. It's just like, right now I'm looking at my face and like, good God. Because <laughs> <sighs> when I think of myself, I guess I don't really think of myself the way I appear to other people. She had no idea it'd be played at a concert. Which is, yeah, young, naive. Oh, she's so cute. Cute little girl. Not cute. <laughs> so generally people on YouTube when they're in front of their uh, cameras are in a very self-reflexive kind of mood. And you'll actually see that in a lot of the videos. But there's also this other side, which is that when we watch YouTube, we're, at, we're generally anonymous. People can't see us watching it. And this has its own impacts as well. Most famously is probably Lev Grossman's op observation in time. Where he says, some of the comments on YouTube make you weep for the future of humanity, just for the spelling alone, never mind the obscenity <laughs> and the naked hatred. So I, I, this, was, this was the actual page I was on when I decided to make this clip. And I'll just take you through what was said here. Um, it's really interesting dialogue. Uh, this is responded by wingman8788. You guys are so gay, it sucks. Query U121, what the fuck are you talking about? Freckly Girl 14 says, YouTube comments make me angry, grr. And Query U responds by saying, then don't comment on YouTube, you shit stain. <laughs> <laughs> so there is this uh, anonymity plus this physical distance plus a rare and ephemeral dialogue create, uh, enable the possibility for this type of hatred. But there's something else. That same anonymity, physical distance, and rare and ephemeral dialogue allow people to feel sort of really relaxed and have this freedom to experience humanity without fear of or say, social anxiety. You can actually sort of stare at people and sort of see them for who they are. It's slightly voyeuristic, you know? And um, it allows you to watch other people without staring at them or making them uncomfortable because they don't see you watching them. You can just watch their videos. And it's really interesting. It's like this sociological experiment where you can just like see their being. You can see their person. All right, so that clip right before she started talking really hits on where we're going here. Oh, shoot, I can't get back to it. So basically, he was saying anonymity provides the opportunity for a lot of really vile things, right? So 4chan got in trouble a couple years ago for child pornography, right? And if you're familiar with the Tor network, which is the way that you access the deep web, which are these sites that are connected around the world that are basically anonymous, um, there's a lot of really dirty things there. So you can buy drugs on the web, you know, anonymously. You can view child pornography. You can hire a hitman. A lot of really bad things out there, right? you know, people behi hiding behind a wall. But it also provides a forum for people in Egypt that want to revolt against a, a really bad government. It gives them a forum for expressing their political be uh, beliefs without fear of being um, persecuted. So it, it's kind of this two-edged sword, right? So which side do we take? And that's where, that's where we're going, and that's what we want you to decide before you leave here tonight. Um, what's, you know, is it ben more beneficial to be anonymous or is it more beneficial to be um, transparent? And we're going to look at two different, very opposing ideals um, Zuckerberg saying that uh, transparency is better for society. Poole saying that anonymity is better. I'm going to let you decide what you think. Before we move on, we want to make sure everyone is on the same field with context collapse. Here it is, dumbed down in my own language. Um, you heard it from a guy with a PhD. You heard it from Goffman in the 50s talking about it. Um, but here it is in my own language. Face-to-face -face interaction, we make careful decisions about how we'll act and what we'll say, taking into account many factors that determine the situation, right? You go online with it. It's nearly impossible to know who your audience will be at times, making it dif difficult to control the interpretation of your message. So when you post that status on Facebook, you know, you assume that you know who's looking. Um, it's your friends on Facebook, but you never know your boss is going to see it and it ends up getting you fired, right? It's really hard to, to know who's looking. All right, so we'll talk about some specifics. We have a nice little metric here, a, a scale. We put uh, Zuckerberg, and that, that's Christopher Poole, a little lesser known face over there. So. Zuckerberg, these are quotes that they, they both gave. We, we chose these guys because they've pretty much battled it out over the years. Over the past few years, they've been the main proponents for pull for anonymity and Zuckerberg for transparency online. There's other players, right? So if you were going to put 
some of these other social networks or, or developer people who are developing tools out there on this, you know, you would probably put Google Plus, which is fairly new over on the transparency side. You can't register with a fake name, right? So they want you to be transparent. You might put sites like Reddit or FARC over here on the anonymity side. They want you to kind of hide behind a fake name and be free to do whatever you want on the site. So there are different players out there, but we're choosing these because they're the loudest in, in the argument, I guess. And there's been real world constraints and issues that have came up that made them change their policies and kind of adjust their, I won't say their view because I can't speak for them, but, but at least the, the implications of these for their sites. So a couple years back, Facebook introduced list functions, which move, which lets you target your audience you want to uh, post updates to. So you, you get a little bit more control of the context. You can say, hey, I only want my friends and family to see this post as opposed to my coworkers, you know. Um, it moves them a little bit away from Zuckerberg's theory that everybody should be accountable and, and present the same face no matter who you're, you're addressing. Yeah, There's I mean, the implication, implementation of it. So recently this privacy thing has, has really blown up and Facebook re-rolled out lists. So you may think this is a new thing. It's actually been on Facebook for a while, that list functionality that Google Plus is, is so known for now. Um, but it allows you to sort of feel like you're targeting your, your status update, right? So you can say, I only want my office friends to see this status update, or I only want my friends from church to see this status update, or whatever the list may be. Um, but really, it doesn't provide you much of anything else, because if you go, for instance, to a page and you like Barack Obama instead of Herman Cain, well, all your friends are going to see that you like Barack Obama, they're going to know your political view. So if that has implications in your professional life or your church life or whatever it may be, the implications are still there. So while you can like subdivide your status updates because of this, it doesn't really do much for you. So it doesn't move him in to the center really at all because it doesn't give you the functionality that you need to, to really have any sort of um, anonymity on the site. Yeah, and so uh, a couple years ago, uh, responding to mainly uh, child pornography complaints and very bad stuff going on in this 4chan message board anonymously, uh, they introduced, it's not an email uh, confirmation, but it's an email field to where you at least have to put in some kind of email. If you'll click over to the screenshot, you'll see this is our attempt to bypass it, which was very easy with a fake name, a fake email account. So it moves them in a little bit, but in the end, it's very easy to get around. Um, How many of you use 4chan? Anyone out there? Got one guy. What about Reddit? Got any Redditors? All right, a couple. Just curious. So recently Facebook has, well, I almost said reintroduced, but it's introduced frictionless sharing. It's almost similar to the Beacon. Uh, Do you guys remember Beacon from several years ago on Facebook? Caused a big stink. It didn't last long. 2008-ish. <laughs> Beacon is basically the same thing as frictionless sharing. Are you familiar with frictionless sharing that just rolled out? Raise your hand if you are. All right, so basically what frictionless sharing is, so Facebook's rolling out all these updates, right, gradually, right now. They've got a whole new layout that's coming out soon to everyone. If you're a develop, Facebook developer, you've already gotten it. Um, one of the, the things that's coming out is frictionless sharing. And what this does is when you go to certain websites, people that have chosen to opt in to frictionless sharing, when you go to their website, everything that you do is automatically shared to Facebook instead of hitting the like button. So if you, if you watch a video on that site or you read an article, it's automatically pushed to Facebook without having to hit a button or take any kind of action. So it's automatically sharing what you're doing around the web without you knowing that it's sharing it, basically. The, so the most prominent example of this, too, is the, the Spotify program, the Spotify music sharing. Doesn't. It's completely integrated with Facebook. You listen to a song and it pops up on your profile and sometimes That's I can't even find it when it happens. A lot of news sites are doing it, so I, I think Washington Post mm -hmm. is one. So if you go to Washington Post and whatever you read, it's automatically being pushed back to Facebook. Yeah, you had a question. Sure. Money. All right. It isn't about transparency. Right. It's to give as much information surreptitiously. It's not about transparency, but surreptitiously. Collecting information. All Were you at the keynote last night? Not yet. He's, well, he's the head CIA agent now, or, or whatever. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> well, but it's not. A, but it's about. It's about capitalism. Sure. That's what it's about. I think there's yeah. truth. I think there's truth to that. I. I I guess the reason we put him in this boat and we're avoiding that discussion, for one, it's very controversial. Two, this is what he says. This is what he's selling, right? He's selling this ideal world where everyone's transparent and everyone's accountable to everyone because 
you can't hide behind anything. That creates a better world. That this is his argument. If it's true or not, you know, I don't want to judge his character without knowing too much about him. Well, we can show you his quote. That I mean, an idealistic so he said, you have one identity. Having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of, lack of integrity. So basically, he's arguing against what Goffman said earlier, that to, to present yourself differently to your husband or, as you, or differently to your boss that you do from your husband is a lack of integrity for whatever reason. I guess as we're saying, we're not trying to base all of our stuff off this one quote. We didn't go into more depth. He said in speeches numerous times that that's his ideal is for one complete self and complete transparency on the internet, whether it's for... All right, so frictionless sharing, you got it. Did you get it, frictionless sharing? Sharing all of your information, really scary stuff, actually. It's, Congress is even talking about it now. Is it constitutional? So we'll see where it goes, but... Do you have to opt into that? You do have to opt into it. The, the, the crazy thing is, though, when, you, when the new rollout comes and you get the new Facebook uh, profile, have you seen that? It looks really cool. I think that as soon as you opt into it, the screen pops up and says, do you want to opt into all these new things? And so people are going to automatically do it because they're thinking, this gets me into this new profile. So it's a little bit dirty, but yeah, there is an opt-in if you read carefully. But who reads terms of service, right? Nobody does that. All right, so here's uh, an example of frictionless sharing. So the, how many of you have the new profile, the new layout? Several of you do. So you know this, this is the new ticker. So what they've done is they've put this little box in the upper right-hand corner of a Facebook page, and it shares all the little things that people are doing on the site. So in the ticker it says, Victor, whoever, watched, what's his name, Robotsy. So it's just showing that this person somewhere on the web watched this video, and Victor Dev didn't press a button to get it to go there. That just automatically popped up on Facebook for everyone to see. So Pool has, he's still running 4chan, but he's moved on to, I think he's still running 4chan. If I'm wrong, y'all can correct me. Um, he's moved on and just launched a site called Canvas. Um, they've actually, it, outwardly, Canvas is, it serves the same function as 4chan. It's an image messaging board. It's got a few different functions. Outwardly, you can still have an anonymous profile, but when you sign up, you have to verify your identity through Facebook Connect. So I guess Pool has recognized the limitations to anonymity, anonymity or at least the concerns with it to the extent to where. So he's he definitely moving more towards the center. He's not on the extreme anymore. He's m forcing you to sign up with Facebook. This is a screenshot of Canvas. All right, so here's a quote. I couldn't find a good picture of a tool, so that's, that's what you get. We shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. So this is what we want to know. We want to know how are the tools that you're using, or if there's developers out there that you're creating, how are they shaping you as a person? How are your tools shaping you? We've got prizes for answers. When you're using Facebook as a Facebook user, how is it changing how you relate to people? Is it changing how you relate to, pe to people? Um, Twitter, YouTube, any tool that you're using out there. Mobile phones. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> do, do you think do you think about the audience that that status update or that image is meant for or do you just think of it as something that you want to share with the world? I think of it a way to express that experience. With anyone. With anyone. Yeah. Okay. How many of you are fresh out of college within the last few years? Several people. So have you, I know I did when I graduated college, I had this sort of identity crisis, like how, how do I dress? Because I have to look professional because I want to get a good job, right? So how do I make sure that I always look professional and I'm always acting in a way that is going to be looked at well by an employer? H have you had that sort of identity crisis of how do I present myself? Did you do it online? Exactly. How do I can present myself to be a 
smarter, or more educated, what smart can I post that people go, ooh, wow. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's not, I think a lot of us do it, just like a lot of us don't necessarily say it out loud. Sure, we, I think we all do it subconsciously. So the things that are, we list on our Facebook page, this is just an exercise in identity creation, right? So we're choosing which pages to like and which songs to upload. If you're not going to upload, like, you can't touch this by MC Hammer, right? Because you're going to get laughed at, unless you're doing it for a gimmick, you know? So everything sort of has a purpose. You're, you're all performing, right, for this presumed audience on Facebook. So I, I think that's dead on. I think we all do that. I even went as far to calm down sort of my political rhetoric. At one point I created a Facebook page for myself, so that would be the outward appearance of me if a potential employer was, was looking on Facebook for me. That's what they would see, as opposed to my, my personal profile. I've since gotten away from that, but um, yeah, I think you're right on there. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I, I pretty much am super bland on Facebook. Like, I don't put sure. up um, any kind of real opinionated content. <coughs> But what, so I do end up posting things like observations about nature or some comment about the moon and listening to, uh, you know, cicadas or something like that. Just because I thought it seemed so, you know, neutral. And then people start commenting like, oh, you're a poet, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> Makes you feel and I'm good. Like, well, I'm really, you know, now, now I catch myself saying, like, don't post something like that because people are going to think that you're trying to be a poet. Right. But Right. And it just sort of backfires and makes me question, like, should I even post at all? So kind of backed off. Sure. So the feedback loop is sort of the scary part about the, about the whole system because you can't even anticipate how it's going to, what the feedback will be, and then it starts making you think a little harder. Have you ever thought about using a service like 4chan or Reddit or FARC? No, no, that, that they are. Okay. Anybody, anybody thought about doing that, abandoning these, these sites out there that force you to be who you are in real life or try to force you to be who you are in real life in order to be anonymous so that you can express things that you wouldn't express on Facebook or Twitter maybe? Anybody use any of those tools? No? All right, I, I saw some other hands who had comments. Teachers have it really bad, yeah. as far as Facebook and is so concerned. So, you know, before there was really internet, I kind of had that identity crisis where I've got two, per, two personas, and so now I've got a Facebook that's uh, that's my personal Facebook, and my my close friends and family are on that, and I keep going in and making sure nobody else can see it, mm -hmm. although it still has my whole name on there, and then I've got my professional one that is attached to my school email. And so I've got one that I'm very careful. You know, I think about, am I presenting a professional image? Am I telling students that these are things that are important to me, but not sounding like, oh yeah, here's a punk rock chick. The chick is still punk rock for <laughs> five years. How many of you have two Facebook accounts? That's interesting. Wow. Several of you. How many of you? have your parents friended you on Facebook and you freaked out about it, right? Everyone goes through that at some point, right? It's scary. <laughs> I think I'm now friends with just about everyone in my family, so it's like a constant freak out party. All right, let's keep moving through some of these questions. I've already asked this, right? How many of you use tools to make you anonymous online on a regular basis? We had some Redditors in here, right? Yeah. Do you have a comment? To the last point, I would yeah. just raise a question. Do you think this is more of a problem that, that some of this I share with what is this maybe one of the problems inherent with larger networks like Facebook and even a lot of the suite of you know maybe Google applications is that they kind of force you to be all things to all people exactly. at the same time. And so I wonder if we're beginning to see a backlash against a very quiet backlash against some mm -hmm. of the larger social networks with more narrowly focused social networks, things like food spotting or Instagram. Sure. Um, because when I go and use, e even though there's a couple more things to do, you know, a couple more networks to maintain, I know exactly who I'm talking to. Right. 
go to that audience. Right. So it's, a, it's a niche audience. Yeah. I work in social media all, all day, right? Right. But my family could care less if I'm there. So, right. you know, things that I, articles that I like about social media on Facebook, I'm like, what's this all about? You know, I'm obsessed with taking pictures of my food. 95% of my friends that I would hang out with on a daily basis probably think that's bizarre. Right. They could care less about a billion pictures of what I had for dinner. Right. Um, so I'm just wondering if maybe that's, like I said, that, that's that's the inherent problem with the be all things to all people social media network is that it, it puts you in that weird position yeah. um, of not really knowing who you're talking to if you friend to everybody for every week. Well, let's ask. So how many of you would use five different niche social networking sites as opposed to Facebook, one big one? Would you prefer to do that or is that too cumbersome? Yeah, so this is probably yeah. how most people feel. Actually, it's very easy to log into Facebook and do everything from one place. I would say I would prefer that too, but it's personal. That's, that's kind of the reason uh, Dr. Wesh uh, coined the, the term context collapse because it's not really, it is the collapse of context if you're in the, the uniform way you're talking about. You know, you friend anybody and you have to be the same person to everybody. But um, it, it's really not the, the complete collapse of context. It's just making us rethink the way we interact. It's, it's seeping into our, our, the context of our daily lives. You know, like the lady says, she goes around and thinks of status updates that she's going throughout her day. So it just makes you rethink how you're addressing people and how you're interacting. There's a, there's a lady by the name of Dana Boyd. Is anybody familiar with her? Yeah. Several of you are. She's kind of one of the leading thinker probably in the country on social media and specifically how young people are using social media out there. Her website is, I believe it's Dana.com, D-A-N-A-H.com, or maybe it's .org. Um, <laughs> but she writes a lot about that, about how young people, digital natives, are just free sharers. They'll share anything. They don't think about um, the context or the audience or anything like that. They just share. So... Um, who knows where we're going? I got a, I've got a question too that kind of piggybacks off of this. Um, who sees the benefit in using an anonymous network? I mean, do you want to elaborate on that? Like, what is the benefit of using it? Do you think, I'll ask this directly to you since you just answered that too, do you think the benefits of being able to interact anonymously online outweigh the potential pitfalls of it? Like, yeah? yeah? yeah. Um, what are your thoughts, I mean, what are some safeguards? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it, How, do, you, do you guys know what Tor is? Or the deep web? So the deep web is basically unindexed websites that are out there. So the way they end in, instead of .com, they're dot onion which is strange I don't know how that came about but the way you access it is by downloading this special software called Tor um, using a browser that's configured that keeps you anonymous and it connects to different servers around in order to get to a server here that's basically a website it goes to five other ones to get you there so it keeps you anonymous but what's happened because of that anonymity is a lot of really bad things so you have people that are having these political discussions and you know trying to wage revolution around the world you know overthrow dictators but you also have child pornographers which is a really big big thing on the deep web so it, it's hard to say what's what's better is it okay you know is it justified to have this free this actual freedom of speech on the deep web even though there's this bad dark side
That's true. Right. If people were taking credit, if it weren't created by non good people, it would be locked down in copyright and all of that. You know, like people would really lock that content down. Part of the benefit of it is that people are able to go on it and remix it because you don't have some asshole coming in and telling you to stop doing it. Right. That's a good point. Do we have any developers out there? Any developers in the room? One back there? Do you think about these sort of things when you're creating whatever? Context collapse? No? I saw another hand. I think there's also so many dangers to transparent, like transparent sites, because there are to anonymous sites. I mean, when you think of cyberbullying or you know, hear about stories where people on YouTube go and blast someone in their school, and then that person commits suicide. I mean, there's dangers with absolutely. Um, we got a few more minutes here. I'm gonna try to got like two more questions. We don't have to get through them, but. I think they're interesting, so we're going to do it. What about mobile and geolocation? So what, is, what are the implications here? So this is the direction that we're moving, right? Everything is going to your pocket. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, it's a cheeky little thing going on that people will know when you're not in your house. Absolutely. So there was an app created that I think it was called Please Rob Me, yeah. and basically it, pu it pulled in your information from Foursquare, so it would know <laughs> that you checked in at your house, because people like to do that, and then when you checked in somewhere else and knew, obviously, you weren't home. So it would pull in that data and say, this person's not at their house. Please rob them. So it's interesting that all that data is out there. They recently did some privacy updates in Foursquare where you can only check into residential places. Like, people can only believe that you're checking into residential places if you're a friend of theirs. Oh, interesting. Because, um, yeah, you know, you don't want to check in. I'm at John's house, you right. know, and people can just see where does John live. Sure. You know? But I'm a marketer, so I like to follow you the minute you get on. Mm -hmm. I want to know where you're going. I want to know what you like because that helps me sell shit to you. Of course. So That's why Zuckerberg likes it too, to this gentleman's point. Any other? Yeah. Um, a really bad thing about uh, this geolocation stuff is that um, people can access it without you knowing it. And, and that kind of adds on to the thing about like, getting raw like RFID and like pictures you take on your iPhone. You can like pull the uh, coordinates out of it and they can send you like six hundred missionaries to go to your house. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Sure. <laughs> yeah, back over here. Right. <laughs> they know you're not home. Right. 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 That's a good point. The scary thing to that, I think user behavior as Americans has to change. We never read terms of service, right? And when you download an app on your phone, it shows, it pulls up and says, we're going to pull all of this information. And most people just kind of glance at it and move on, right? Yeah, I want to download it. I want this app. But it, you'd be surprised if you looked at your cell phone to see how many apps are actually pulling geolocation information from your phone. Apps that you wouldn't think need that, they're pulling it anyway because they want the data. So I think as users, we have to change our behavior and be responsible and know which, which applications are pulling that information. And some of it's not as, as forthcoming, at least to me, as it should be. Like, yeah, if you download the Facebook app on your phone and, and let them use geolocations, next thing you do, you post a status update from the conference here, and it says near Savannah, Georgia, un under the status update, though. So I, I, I'll make sure I'm real careful about that. There's one back there, yeah. Right. To the first responders. The 
fact that when you call us and tell us that you um, that you're stuck on the side of the road, and that could be either through your vehicle or your phone or anything. Um, even that is, you're giving away your key location. Sure. Um, and we got people calling us and saying, "But why are you giving? Why are you giving my location to um, a tow truck? Like because the tow truck." I'm not. I'm not trying to make fun of it, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, 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 it sounds funny, but it's because there was other discussions that were going on, and I think the the relation of we we don't, sometimes don't even know the thing that we signed up for. To your point, whether it's in an app or some of the subscriptions that we have, or any other thing. And if you really take that step, I think the, the young lady that just talked about um, the fact that she had to go back to her Facebook and kind of look at everything. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Over the years, we've all subscribed to something that um, might not be on the web, but it still gives away a lot of our information. So it's just the, it's a different platform that we're talking about now. Uh, and the number of channels and those types of things. It's a very interesting discussion that we've been having internally as well the last uh, two or three years, because that's what our service is based on, is on your location. Absolutely. That's interesting. All right, so we're running out of time, so I'm just going to ask the last question. And I've got three more things that I'll give away to anyone who answers. Which is better for society, transparency or anonymity? And you've got to tell me why. And Shoot this first. one's for the I read your emails t-shirt. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it comes down to personal responsibility. Which one's better? It's personal choice. Because it ends up that 90% of us pay for the foolishness of 10%. And I don't want the 10% of the idiots to decide that I must be transparent or that I must be anonymous. That should be my choice. You want the controls. That should be my choice. That makes sense. Who else? Back here in the red cap. You know, I think in the long run, with, you know, as social media Just used to, you know, go forward and the fact that, you know, we're having this conversation about digital natives who are over here. I think transparency is, you know, where the future is going. And I think in the long run, it, it's going to sort of create a little more acceptance and a little more tolerance in society just because people are going to be putting these ideas out there. They're, you know, they are who they are. It, it's just going to sort of become this singular identity that each person has through these social media outlets as opposed to, you know, trying to have this, this work identity and this, you know, then this personal time identity. And so, you know, I think transparency is, is where it's headed in the future. The implications for that are huge, though, if you think about oh, it. I, I mean, so you, you, and if that's the case, then in 10 years, you can walk up to your boss and say, shove it, asshole, and you don't right. get fired, right? Yeah, I mean, because not, not, these not necessarily are, quite that far either. I mean, you know, it's going to change the way that we relate. Society still will have norms, and, you know, society will still have, you know, checks and balances on people and tell them, you know, this is what's acceptable, this is not what's this is what's not acceptable, sure. but I think it's just going to sort of create a, a little more openness and a little more tolerance in the long run for, you know. There was an article in, I believe, the AJC several months ago about a teacher in Atlanta who went to Europe on vacation, took a picture of herself holding a glass of wine in Europe, where this is, you know, much more tolerated than it is in the Deep South anyway, posted it to her Facebook where she was friends with some of her students and she was fired because she was holding a glass of wine. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, but I think to your point, yeah, I think that will slowly evolve. Um, take, nope. your, take your pick. We've got a mask of anonymity and some like, like and dislike, dislike stamps. stamps. I'll like just take the like stamps. <laughs> All right. Last up, mask of anonymity. Last person who hasn't talked. I think he hasn't talked. You, you talked. I think the transparency is overall be better Maybe we'll see. I think Clay was telling me yesterday that someone has developed a tool to be able to find out the identity of people on tour, which everyone thought was completely anonymous um, just recently in the last week. So, it, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> All right, so we're, I think we're out of time. We appreciate the discussion. It's very interesting for